can wait one minute and we can start. Yeah. But I think the recording has already started. Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our cement session anti-racism learning series. The kickoff session of the year entitled The Change Weaving Liberating the Colonized Mind. We came out from a very challenging year, 2020. We lost many colleagues such as Gerd, Hendrix, Hospital, and others. We wish you a wonderful and prosperous new year 2021. As you know, one of the highlights of the anti-racism learning series is to educate ourselves on the anti-racism and its intersectionality with the intercultural field. However, I am wondering, and I want to ask a question to our audience. Are we over dramatizing the significance of racism or we unable to appreciate its impact? So I am Papa Balandong from Senegal, living in Valencia since over 18 years. I am an intercultural social mediator and Sieta Espana member. Today, I have a responsibility with my colleague, Yvonne van der Poel, trainer, consultant, online learning expert at Luz Azul, and interim president at CHR Netherlands to run and moderate this seventh session. And we will take, we will take care about the Q&I and the chat, and we will ask you to share your question after the presentation in the Q&I because we can lose the question in the chat and we hope we're gonna have a very active and dynamic chat. Uh, so we will send also our community guideline uh, to the chat. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> right now, uh, I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pritima Chanani Barta. Doctor, thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Doctor uh, Pritima Chanani Barta, uh, uh, before we dig in the session, our audience uh, want to get to know you uh, a bit better. So, Dr. Pritima Chanani Barta was born in India and completed her PhD in German language and literature from the University of Mumbai. Currently, she works as intercultural coordinator 
for the Fulda University of Applied Science in Germany, where she is responsible for promoting intercultural competence. Dr. Pritima is committed in her work to promote diversity. She claims that education and NTDS trainings form the groundwork for developing a mindset free from the barriers of prejudice and discrimination. It's really where well, uh, I meet her in Central Europa, Seek Africa uh, education webinar, uh, where we have talked uh, about colonialism educational system in Africa. So today we're gonna have a new phase of research. That's why she uh, wants to talk about uh, her experience in India and also her experience in racism in Germany. Uh, Dr. Pritima, well, welcome again. Thank you. And over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much, uh, Papa, for this wonderful introduction. I'm very happy to be here today and um, to give a presentation on this very sensitive topic um, in our anti-racism series. Um, I will be giving you a short presentation of about 40 minutes and will be open to questions after my presentation. So please go ahead and put your questions in the q and I'll be very happy to answer them. Okay, so let me start. Namaskar. Let me greet you all this Indian style. COVID has appended every aspect, every routine, every ritual in our lives to the extent that it has even changed our greeting styles too. Instead of shaking hands, we just touch elbows now or verbally greet each other. And I like the non-physical contact Indian style of greeting. And this is what I have been using. Namaste or Namaskar. Namaste means I greet the divine in you. I greet the divine in you. I bow to the divine in you. Namaste is said by joining hands together and with a slight bow. There are two things to take from such a greeting. One is I bow or I greet. This is a sign of respect, of showing reverence towards the other person's being. The bow also signifies your openness to connect with the other person. The other aspect is the divine. The divine is not something in this greeting that is just a God to God. The divine is the self, the being of the other person, pure, untainted, without ego, without supremacy, without inferior qualities. It is unique, it is special. And when you are greeted in a similar manner in India, also with a bow and namaste, you're opening up to connect with the other person, acknowledging the same respect to the other person. So in other words, there is no one here who is superior or inferior or less worthy or more worthy. We're all divine and we're all one when we are connected to that divine energy. So if we all have that divine energy in us and we're all one, where does that feeling of inferiority or superiority come in? There are several theories to this. One vital influence is our thinking, as we all know, which comes from education and upbringing. And as we all know, education itself is subjected to the influencing powers of educators who believe, who themselves are conditioned by their own ideologies through the kind of education they receive and the ideals that are imparted to them, people may be educated to believe that they are either superior, inferior, privileged, underprivileged, and so on. And this is what my talk is going to be about, the change within. 
So let me show you my slide. I guess you can see it, Papa. Yeah. Yes. So just confirming. Okay. So this is what my talk is going to be about the change within how to free the mind change to historic ideologies of the past. In my talk, I will describe how the social, cultural and educational background inculcates a feeling of superiority or inferiority in a person. The focus of my work is not, does not involve post-colonial studies, but I do use a few concepts for my work. And I'd like to clarify some of these, which I adopt in my trainings. I will focus this talk on how people from former colonies identify with the norms of superiority and inferiority handed over to them by their colonial rulers. You will see how imperialist ideology is still alive, albeit subconsciously, in the minds of the former colonized people, how their mindset is still chained to the ideology that they are inferior. We won't stop at just looking at colonized minds, but we will consider current challenges and look into the future. Based on some of the work I do in Germany, I would like to share with you some of the strategies which I have found effective in fostering diversity and inclusion. Let me start by giving you an example. I did my education in India. I went to a nun school where you can well imagine we had very strict rules. Born in the era of post-independent India, Naturally, our teachers who had experienced British colonial rule as children and attainment of freedom in 1947, instilled in us the spirit of patriotism and pride in the freedom struggle. So as Indian children, we were taught how great our country was in gaining independence from a giant like Britain. Our upbringing was strongly influenced by values of national pride and the ideology of freedom from our British colonial rulers. Yet, we never discussed freedom from the colonized mind or education. The books we borrowed from the library were books published in the UK depicting blue-eyed children, most of them having blonde hair, who played lacrosse and ate hot bull's eyes, whatever that is. To date, I have not eaten hot bull's eyes. To date, I don't know what the game is about, and I have never seen a lacrosse racket. In one of her TED Talks, Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie talks about her childhood and the characters in her stories, which she wrote as a child. Her characters also drink, drank ginger beer, and she had no idea at that time what ginger beer is. I found she was telling my story. The people of the former colonies may have attained political independence from their colonizers. The question is whether they have attained liberation from imperialist ideology. As I said earlier, I'd like to focus a, a bit on post-colonial concepts, which I use in my trainings. According to post-colonial studies, there is a difference between colonialism and imperialism. We use the two terms interchangeably, but there are slight differences in their connotations. Colonialism is a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. The term colony comes from the Latin word colonis, meaning farmer. Colonialism is a practice whereby the people from one country conquer the land of another country. The conquerors then usually move to the country they have conquered and become permanent settlers there. They, however, remain loyal to their country of origin. So colonialism is a political conquest. As the definition goes, Imperialism, on the other hand, comes from the Latin term imperium, meaning to, meaning to command. It means that the settlers exercise power over others to control them using certain mechanisms, either through settlement or other indirect means of control. In this talk, I refer to colonialism as directly related to a political conquest and imperialism as an ideological mindset associated with the superiority of the culture or race of the colonizers. A 
according to the imperialist ideology of colonizers who consider themselves superior. They also have the right to take over other lands. In fact, it is their moral obligation, their duty to take over, uh, over other lands because the people of these colonies are not civilized. They are savages and are in need of a savior who will save them from their savage ways. To highlight this ideology, let me read you a verse from The White Man's Burden where Rudyard Kipling exhorts white Americans to take up their thankless mission of conquering the Philippine Islands and tame the savage tribals or heathen there. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best he breed, go send your sons to exile, to serve your captives' needs, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. As the poem goes, it is the moral responsibility of the whites to conquer and rule over the Philippine islands as the native people are not capable of doing so themselves. In other words, it is a great sacrifice that the whites have to perform because they will be at the beck and call of the people they have conquered and they have the moral obligation of taming them, of making them more human. It is the duty they have to perform simply by virtue of their whiteness. There will be no gratitude shown to them. So it is in fact a thankless task that needs to be done. We have come a long way, thankfully, from Kipling's way of thinking, of believing that non-whites are savages in need of civilization and who need to be saved from their own primitive ways. We are realistic enough, however, to know that there are several who still believe in the imperialist ideology and virtues of white supremacy, and they will probably never change their warped thinking. The minds of the colonized people, according to imperialists, were considered infantile. Tribal culture seemed to have an effect on the brain culture. And colonized people were therefore considered abnormal and needed to be tamed. By highlighting the differences between European imperialist culture and the colonized natives, colonial rulers fueled the arguments against independence. Anti-colonial and freedom struggles were a sign of madness, which was considered a natural consequence of the infantile mind of the natives. As Kipling says, it was for the white rulers to tame these infantile tribal natives. And the way to do that was to make them adopt the belief in white supremacy, and most important, to serve the whites. Sorry. <laughs> they did a good job of that. The ideologies of white supremacy have been deeply embedded in the mindset of the colonized countries. Let me give you an example here. Like all little girls, my friends and I also used to play with dolls in India. And believe me, these were uh, expensive toys a few days ago. We had two dolls, Mala and Penelope. Mala had Indian features, was a big doll, dark skinned, black hair and eyes. In fact, she was a special doll because her eyes would open and close, something that was a rare feature in dolls in those days. She also had very beautiful clothes. She was as big as my, as my arm. The second doll, Penelope, was a little doll as big as my palm. So nothing special about her. She just had blonde hair, blue eyes, which didn't close. In fact, a flat rubber painted face. Yet when we played, Mala was made to wear rags and tattered clothes. And Penelope, who came with ordinary clothes, was somehow dressed up to look more beautiful so that she could be the princess. Can you guess who was Penelope's servant? And this is a mindset that has not completely changed. If you look at the dolls sold in India today, you will still find a majority and a preference for white dolls, nothing to do with Indian features. I'm not saying we don't have a variety of Indian dolls in India now, but what I'm saying is you will still find a preference for white dolls. Okay. So move on. So what I'm actually getting at is that people from the former colonies 
have internalized imperialist structures and ideology. Even though the colonies have attained their political freedom, the mindset is not decolonized. And here's a quote from an article from, uh, on post-colonial studies. The intimate enemy is the ongoing state of mind that dominated people, uh, sorry. <laughs> the intimate enemy is the ongoing state of mind that leads dominated people to accept the stereotypes of the dominance discourse. You only need to look at education and academic curriculum in several of the colonies today. I would use India as an example here. Curriculum in schools and colleges is quite Eurocentric. In English, we look at British literature in schools, but there's no mention of Indian English literature. There's nothing wrong between Shakespeare and school, but what I find regrettable is the fact that we ignore we have good Indian English writers. So in history, in India, we look at our Indian, our freedom struggle, but we do not look at how a century of colonial rule has affected the mindset of the people. Several in regional language schools, which do focus on Indian works and literature, unfortunately often provide education of a comparatively media quality. The result is students then attending college later on are not able to meet the academic standards of an English medium institution. Colonized people, in fact, try or try to copy or resemble their colonial rulers because in doing so, they were able to find their feeling of self-worth and dignity and were no longer the savages as they had been given to believe. They began to see their world through the eyes of the imperialists. And this is what post-colonial writer Gayatri Spiva calls worlding. Worlding is a process through which the local population was persuaded to accept the European version of reality for understanding their social world. Worlding implies that the privileged or imperialists in this case ascribe meaning to the culture of the colonized people with the aim to understand them, but which then become reality for the colonized people. Imperialists shape models for the colonized, which become the latter's aspiration and consequently drives the colonized people to model themselves or to adapt behavior to meet the ideals handed over to them by their former colonial rulers. Thus, colonized people actually begin to see their own world and culture through the eyes of their rulers. In my opinion, if education in the previous colonies focuses on Eurocentric studies and enhances that culture, we will be subtly dominated by the ideologies of colonial rule. Unthinkingly, in day-to-day -day life, you learn to look up to certain man mannerisms and behaviors which were inherited from the colonial rulers. Colonized people also learned that norms and behaviors of the whites are superior. Here's another example. If you grew up in any of the colonies and if you mastered the norms of behavior and lifestyle of the colonizers, you were sophisticated. It is sophisticated to eat with knife and fork, although we eat with our hands in India. If you don't master the art of eating with a knife and fork in some very posh restaurants, you're not considered civilized. And this is what I heard from a lady who went on a date with her fiance. And I quote, I was so thankful I learned to how to use the knife and fork from a very good friend when I was in school. My fiance was rather surprised I could manage with this cutlery, but very proud of me as he didn't lose face during dinner at the restaurant. That friend saved me from a lot of embarrassment. Worlding, according to me, distorts the mindset and even the approach to one's own culture. Even in a country like India, as I mentioned before, white skin is a beauty ideal, which is why, for instance, you find face cream on the market, which is called fair and lovely. Women do bleaching to make their skin look fairer. To the extent that even during marriages, a fair-skinned bride is considered beautiful. And a dark-skinned bride can consider herself lucky if she finds a fair-skinned bridegroom. I know that all of this is changing and has changed in India considerably. But I cannot 
undermine the impact a century of colonial rule and imperialist ideology has had on the mindsets of the people who were colonized. You cannot wipe out that impact with a few years of globalization. Colonialism was a system of oppression and the ideology of imperialism forces the colonized people into roles of submissiveness in some way or the other. Here's another quote from an article from on post-colonial studies. The colonial project denies any value or to local cultures and traditions, thus introducing and maintaining an internalized sense of inadequacy and backwardness when compared to Western cultures and civilization. The colonized are assigned roles and forced into submissiveness. Paulo Freire, in his Pedagogy of the Oppressed, states, and I quote here, the pedagogy of the, the, the behavior of the oppressed is a prescribed behavior, following as it does the guidelines of the oppressor, end of quote. Here's another example of a mindset domesticated to submissiveness. I do workshops with international students to provide them with some orientation on the German education system and lifestyle and culture in Germany. During these workshops, I'm often told about their experiences on discrimination. Like one of my Pakistani students was forced to show his identity to his German language trainer simply because the trainer didn't believe he was Hindu. I wonder what would have happened if the trainer had raised the question of proving one's faith with a British national or French, particularly if the person had been white. Coming from a formerly colonized country, you are taught to obey and obey for sure when you are in a predominantly white country. And that is the further implication of colonialism and imperialism. Submissiveness as a result of imperialist ideology is domesticating. The oppressed or the subjugated have mastered these roles of submissiveness. We have laws in Germany to protect those encountering discrimination of any kind. We have anti-discriminatory rules, regulations and guidelines at universities, but let's not go into all the categories of discrimination. Let's just take racism. In the work I do at universities as well as schools, I find students telling me about their experiences with racism on an informal basis. Our international students contact the student body on campus and seek a sympathetic ear from their peers, but there's no willingness to lodge a formal complaint or rather very little willingness to lodge a formal complaint and take action because it is not considered an important issue. It is not only their fears of complaining when they, when they experience discrimination due to nationality or religion from their professors, or from their instructors for fear of such a complaint influencing their grade later. It is also in peer-to-peer -peer interaction that international students have not learned to cope with blatant racism shown towards them, like white students getting up and sitting elsewhere so that they are not close to them. There is no drive to exercise their rights. So how does one liberate oneself from these colonial or imperialist structures? We need to keep in mind colonialism and imperialism are systems of oppression. According to Paulo Freire, the oppressor wants to keep the system intact because changing the system would mean losing power. It is in the interest of the oppressor to continue with the state of subservience. Any intervention is not in the ruler's interest. If you start questioning the system, you're creating a crisis. So we need to transform this power of oppression, liberate ourselves from oppressive reality. And this can only be done through praxis. We must adopt a reflective attitude to challenge and change an oppressive system. The idea is not to become oppressor yourself, but become aware of oppression and then liberate yourself from oppressive structures and humanize the oppressors too. The idea is not to change poles, but to create a world in which there is no oppressor and no oppressed. As Paulo Freire puts it, violence is initiated by those who oppress, who exploit, who fail to recognize others as persons, 
not by those who are oppressed, exploited and unrecognized. It is not the unloved who initiate disaffection, but those who cannot love because love only because they love only themselves. It is not the helpless subject to terror who initiate terror, but the violent who with their power create the concrete situation which begets the rejects of life. Unfortunately though, the oppressed have learned the behavior of the oppressed at times, and sometimes the tables are turned in an unfavorable manner. Now the oppressed has learned what it means to have privileges and how you can manipulate those privileges to your advantage and is unfortunately doing just that in many cases. I would like to touch on the sensitive issue here and give you just one example of several that I have experienced. As I mentioned earlier, in my struggle against racism, I have seen on the one hand, those experiencing racism, unwilling or afraid to raise their voices and protest against racism. I find that tragic, but I find it also very unfortunate as I have seen racism being instrumentalized to gain one's own selfish ends. For example, students accusing an instructor of downgrading them due to skin color. I have seen people of skin color using their skin color to gain their personal advantage. And this is not a one-time story. This is why I need to mention it here. Please understand, I am not saying you don't combat, combat racism when you experience it or are witness to it. You do, you must. And those who experience racism do need a platform and they must be provided this platform where they can raise their voices. What I'm saying is don't manipulate that platform. It doesn't serve our purpose. You don't replace one unjust system of power with another because the idea is the same, the oppressor and the oppressed. And when racism is in instrumentalized for selfish motives, it is the whites who are put under pressure and are being unjustly accused of rape discrimination. What I am saying is the power of liberation is being used as an unfair means to achieve selfish gains. And that is tragic. This only creates more animosity and causes polarization. The older order of subjugation through superiority of a culture should not perpetuate itself. I had to mention this as I have seen this happening at several universities, as well as in schools, which have a large migrant population in Germany. For instance, white female school teachers comment on the disrespect shown towards them as women by male migrants. And yet, when they complain, they are accused of being unfair and discriminatory towards immigrants. Another aspect is the glorification of one's own culture to the extent of putting down another culture. As I said earlier, education in India is predominantly Eurocentric or Western. Yet, ever since there, ever since there has been greater awareness about the greatness of Indian culture, you will not just find the glorification of ancient Indian culture, but also a fanatic obsession with its greatness. Another form of supremacy has taken root and is arising in former colonies like India, which leads to subjugation of certain minorities. This is certainly not liberating a mind that has been colonized for centuries, but simply the perpetuation of another oppressive reality. So what, for instance, was Paulo Freire's idea about liberating the oppressed or what we call here the colonized mind and how do the oppressed go about it? The first thing is to become aware of the oppressed structures internalized in the colonized, colonial mindset or colonized mind, sorry. Applying Freire's philosophy to our topic of racism, this means those who encounter racism need to believe in their self-worth per se and not that to be is to be like the oppressed. It is about bringing forth a being that is human, that is neither oppressed nor, op nor oppressor, but as Freire puts it, human in the process of achieving freedom. When it comes to liberation from the oppressed system, this is very much part of my training work and there's a lot of healing that is, needs to be done. Particularly when there are immigrants in workshops or classes, 
they need the platform to conduct dialogue on their culture. As interculturalists, we need to reach out to these participants who perhaps need some support and maybe, mo maybe motivation in liberating themselves from their internalized imperialist structures. According to Freire, the method to create a system where everyone is on an equal footing, no oppressors, no oppressed, is possible through the act of love. And what does he mean by this? The act of love is opening up to the others, giving unconditionally to the others, despite the fear of being turned down or shunned. In other words, those who are oppressed or underprivileged need to critically look at the system which is perpetuating itself. And it is our task, our moral ob obligation to, to dislodge a system that is an oppressed system where racism is perpetuated. I had an Iranian past participant who felt very ashamed about her culture. And it was in the training that she was in some way able to liberate herself from the shame of being Iranian. She started talking about her roots and basked in the interest and admiration about the Iranian culture when the other German participants expressed their awe. No doubt this is not necessarily about colonized mind, but it certainly tells us a lot about a system of oppression even today. Now the oppressed are the refugees fleeing from oppression in their own countries and seeking refuge in host countries. My Iranian participants words at the end of the training were, I feel liberated. I realize I have no reason to feel ashamed of me being me. So when it comes to humanizing the system or humanizing the oppressor, it can only be done through unconditioned love. When I apply Freire's pedagogy of giving unconditioned love, I am reminded of Biden's speech as president-elect in November. He didn't talk about revenge. And in fact, he even clearly mentioned that this is not the time to gloat. People need to give each other a chance to come together and do healing together. This is no doubt a challenge for all of us. And it is a challenge for every state of mind too because we are programmed in the system of oppression and discrimination. In Germany, we do not just have issues on skin color racism. Anti-Semitism and discrimination based on ethnic and religious background is widely prevalent. And I find myself working on these issues more than before. Some people who are Germans and do not fit into the image of white skin and colored eyes and blonde hair, where their ethnic or cultural background is not clear, are often automatically categorized as outsiders, non-native Germans. Or you will find some white Germans expressing their pity as these colored people are automatically regarded as refugees. To make it worse, such white Germans unthinkingly express their happiness that, and I quote from a participant in a workshop, this black person at last got the opportunity to live in Germany and learn the German language and culture. This is another form of racism. To categorize a person's nationality, ethnic or cultural background based on the color of the skin and claim superiority for one's own culture. In the work I do, I believe we can combat discrimination and foster diversity and inclusion when we work at all fronts. You can't keep an unjust system and then provide people with certain skills to deal with racism. So I work with parents, teachers, students, and with business professionals. Now I'm, I'm involved in a project which is sponsored by the state of Hessen where I live. This is a project where we offer workshops to parents, school staff, as well as teachers on topics related to anything to do with schooling. So in order to foster diversity, we organized workshops for parents in schools with high immigrant backgrounds. We were two trainers. I attended to parents who were immigrants, not proficient in the German language, because I'm also a German language trainer. It was imperative here that the voice of immigrant parents be heard, that German parents, school teachers and principals understand the inhibitions, the fears, the challenges, the conflicts that immigrant parents face, bringing up their children in a culture which is totally foreign to them.
but it was just as important that immigrant parents also realize the issues that school teachers and native German parents also face with immigrant issues. After a short discourse on diversity, we broke up into groups. Each group had to come up with ideas to prevent discrimination and prevent, promote diversity of cultures in that school. At the end of the workshop, participants wrote a postcard of at least one action they would implement to reach their goal of fostering diversity. We sent these postcards to the participants a month later to remind them of their intentions. The workshop was a great success. Immigrant parents, whose voices are hardly ever heard, were able to speak up because they felt more confident in voicing their thoughts and their opinions. There was no animosity at the end of the workshop, but only a feeling of togetherness and motivation to establish a school culture based on respect and togetherness. In my workshops, which I do with international students, I discuss with them the concept of dignity and self-worth. We find an equivalent term in their own native language. And then we try to define what this means to each of us in our culture. We move on to discuss ways in which a person can lose face, but also be humiliated and how dignity can be violated. We discuss so subtle mechanisms which are humiliating, but we feel helpless and are unable to react adequately. One such example came from a student from the former colonies who constantly had to justify himself and excel in the group project simply because his German peers were of the opinion that people from his country did not possess the desired caliber to deal with demanding intellectual projects. Remember Kipling? In a role play, we provoked the student until he was able to respond adequately and demand the respect he deserved from his peers. But we really had to take him to his limits and it was a very moving experience. One exercise on unconscious bias with participants, irrespective of cultural background, is to get them to check their own biased mind and where they would be discriminating, even if it is unintentionally or unconsciously. In one such exercise, Participants had to choose to sit next to one of four passengers on a train. A girl in jeans and t-shirt, a boy with colored hair and completely tattooed and piercings and torn jeans, a lady with a headscarf and a lady with, in a burqa. What happened? Most of them chose the girls in jeans or the boy with bright colored hair and piercings. 1% chose the lady with the headscarf and no one wanted to sit next to the lady in the burqa. On questioning them, many of the male participants said it was a cultural gap. They felt uncertain that they could be shunned or appear offensive. That is why they preferred not to. Understandable. Even when I asked if they would be more willing, if a man had been sitting next to the lady in the burqa, they were not willing. And why not the ladies? No one could give me an answer. I reminded them that the lady in the burqa was not dangerous. She may re represent a certain way of life, not aligned with their own, but there was no threat to life with her. The goal of the exercise was to create awareness of the ways in which people who are privileged can afford to exclude those, they've, those they feel like, how they can exclude those who are less privileged. Yet, the same privileged people will go to the Red Cross and donate tons of clothes and shoes and feel good about it. And this is what Freire calls false generosity. There is not a single workshop that I do with professionals where I do not highlight the racism prevalent in Germany. I'm often met with shock and disbelief, but since my examples are authentic and real life examples, there is no doubting my story. These examples are food for thought for my German participants. It makes them get off their high horse and forces them to see some of the ugly realities of German society. Finally, here's an example of the work I do in my city to create awareness on racism and violence. I live close to a big city called Hanau. At the market square in Hanau, you will find a statue of the Grimm brothers as a symbol of their contribution to children's literature. Every year we have a Grimm's festival here. 
a good friend of mine drew this picture of the statue on the day of an extremist attack in the bars of Hanau. The shooting was directed towards immigrants. Nine died. The killer shot himself. This happened last year on 19th February. The extremist attacks sent shockwaves through Germany, particularly to the residents of Hanau and the neighborhood who believed they had been living in a safe space. Suddenly we were no longer safe. The attack shattered me too, as I live about six kilometers from Hanau. And Hanau being a big city, it's a place where my teenager children often meet with their friends in bars and pubs. In this picture, the Grimm brothers are seen mourning for the victims of a brutal and fatal racist attack on immigrants. Even before Disney depicted the famous characters of the fairy stories, Grimm's fairy tales had been strongly having an impact on the minds of children in the colonies, shaping the ideals of what is beautiful and what is ugly. Take a story like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Maybe it was not written with a racist motive or perspective in mind. But can you imagine the effect on people in the colonies when they encounter a statement like, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? A statement like that can strongly impress on the minds of colonized children that the beauty ideal that white is beautiful and black is ugly. However, this picture is not about any ideal of skin color or beauty. It reflects the trauma and pain caused by the hurt and insult we, in, we human beings heap on each other. The article so inspired me to take action that I wrote, an, uh, sorry, the picture inspired me to take action. And I wrote an article for the first time in the City Mag Magazine. I wrote about the pain that those encountering racism and racist violence or any other kind of discrimination experience and I also wrote about the pain and sadness of those who solidarize with people of color and support anti-racist movements or discrimination also experience. Both are in pain. This article and the picture therefore reflect the need of our day, healing. There is a lot of healing to be done for those who experience discrimination, but also for those who do not experience it, but solidarize. Together with the picture, the article created quite a sensation in the city and its neighborhood. These are but small ways that I find of healing the wounds of discrimination, which I am certainly not free of and which are inflicted in day-to-day -day life as I witness them. And as a sage in India who lived in the 19th century once said, you fight with patience and you win with faith. By this we mean faith in ourselves and in what we believe. Let me end this talk on a positive note for the year 2021. This is a poem written by one of our greatest Indian poets, Rabindranath Tagore. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards per perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you for listening. Namaskar. So actually I wanted, here's my contact. If you'd like to make a picture and contact me even after, the, after this talk, you're most welcome to do so. And here is a list of references. If you'd also like to take a picture, if you want to read up on further material, I can't move this, I know what's happening. Yeah, so one well one. And this is some reference for India. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Pritiba Chanel. I thank you too. We are so, so happy for your big and great presentation. 
the tone, the rhythm, uh, the different color. Uh, thank you so thank much you. also for um, the spotlight in the um, uh, colonialism matrix forever and also in the educational system and how that affect our mindset and also uh, what's happening now. Uh, so uh, we really have, I think, the big picture of the instrumentalization uh, between India, Europe, uh, Germany, and across the world. I just want, uh, before uh, our audience question, uh, to ask you a question. My question is, can individuals ever take cover in saying it was not intended if their words or action are received or seen as being racist? Mm -hmm. Papa, we are talking about healing. That's the message I'm giving here. And when you inflict wounds on somebody, whether it's intentional or unintentional, you don't take cover. What you do is when you see someone is hurt, you apply a balm, you apply medication. That's what you do when you want to heal someone. And that's what is important for me. You don't take cover. You don't run away and say, oh, I didn't want to hurt you and, you know, and just disappear. You need to do something so that this person heals. And that is, what, that is what is important, that is healing. When you hurt someone, it doesn't matter whether it's intentional, unintentional, the point is how do you go about healing? So what you said, you don't take cover, you heal. You do whatever you can to heal that wound. That's my, that's my, um, that's my, my opinion, yeah. Yeah, you can't make excuses um, and say, well, I think that hurts most. When you just make excuses and say, oh, but I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, when you see the other person is hurt, when you see the other person is in pain, you don't run undercover. Yeah. I, you're on mute, Papa, you're on mute. Uh, quickly, also, it was related to my second question, finally. Uh, what excuses would you see as being acceptable for individuals to give in refusing to challenge a racist action or expression and not themselves to be guilty of being racist either knowingly or no lingly. Well, as I said before, this is not, there is no excuse. For me, it's not a matter of, of uh, finding any excuses which you find acceptable or inacceptable. The point for me here is something was said which hurt someone. And that's the biggest problem that people do not, you know, people do not feel that pain. There is, there is um, what we need here is empathy. It's not about excuses. There is no excuse. What I'm saying is what we, we need empathy. We need to heal those wounds. That is what is important and that is, should be the focus. So those who are in pain need to, need to do healing, but those who inflict pain, and as you said, they don't need to look for excuses. Like, for instance, uh, the example I gave with, uh, with Germany, you know, where um, uh, people who are uh, not necessarily immigrants, but who do not fit to this image of, um, of a white, blonde German, they're automatically categorized as refugees and so on. And then to turn around and say, oh, I didn't mean to hurt you. I was just showing interest. Maybe it was not intentional. There's no excuse for this. What I'm saying is when you see pain, you don't find an excuse for the pain you've, you've caused. 
you address that pain. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Petima. I just want to uh, move around. Uh, we have a, uh, some question in the Q&A. Uh, the first question is uh, from Sanjita Popat. Uh, Sanjita Popat asks, are those students you perceive as utilizing racism for selfish motives doing this consciously or is it rather an unconscious strategy which is kind of unfortunate coping? No, it's, as I mentioned, it happens and it is done consciously. My experience has been, there may be some who do it also unconsciously. That's not the point. The point is I'm, I was referring to those who consciously use it. And I've also seen like, for instance, in my experience, I work for several universities as a freelancer. Another example is when um, students from abroad apply and their application criteria does not meet the requirements of admission for seat in here in Germany. And the admission is refused. And uh, then you have the peers from the other country where they, um, you know, address the president or whatever of the of the school and say, well, this is racist. You're not rejecting an application on for on the basis of racism. It's because the because the um, the demands are not met. The requisites, uh, the conditions for admission are not met. And I was talking about those who do it consciously. And that is that is what I find very tragic because this is not the reason I am in this field and several of us are not in this field. This is not, this is, this is not, this is defeating our purpose. This is not the reason why we are struggling against racism. Yeah. We have a little question from Sanjita Popat. Uh, say, do you distinguish traditional oppressive Indian values from colonial oppressive values? Um, do I distinguish traditional oppressive Indian values from colonial oppressive values? I would say oppressive values are oppressive values, right? You have oppressive values which have come from the colonial Indian values. And I think what she's also referring to is the caste system, which is, uh, let's call it the traditional oppressive values. That's the other aspect, caste system in India, right? But the point is, it's an oppressive value. Here I was talking about colonial oppressive values. That's what I was talking about, yeah. So this is like another add-on. There is certainly a difference, but the point is those who are oppressed, those are the ones who are suffering. That's the point. Whether they are from the traditional uh, Indian oppressed values or whether it is the colonial oppressed values. It's somebody who is suffering, somebody who is in pain, and we have enough pain in the world. We have uh, the next question from Joe Kerners. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure. Well, did I answer the questions? I'm not very sure because I. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes. But but we have a, we have a lot of question uh, in the mm -hmm. in the Kunai. Uh, uh, moving uh, to another one, uh, Joe Kerners. Uh, he's asking about who focus naturally. No, he, he say you focus naturally on British colonialism in India. Uh, do you have any comment on other colonial history? Um, example, Arab colonization of North Africa on Berber people and modern colonial, uh, I think it's, let me say structure, mm -hmm. such as Chinese state treatment of Uyghur people in Qing Giang province? I wouldn't go into that uh, area at all because as I, uh, I uh, mentioned earlier, the focus of my work is not really post-colonial concepts. The focus of my work is more intercultural stuff, but I just use these concepts and I use some of the articles for my work. But I wouldn't like to go into this area because I, uh, and, um, to one of the reasons why we met uh, Papa on um, Sita Africa is because I wanted to also get to know 
what it is like in Africa and other countries. Yeah, but I think I'd leave this question to uh, those who are specialized in in uh, African culture or in, in North African culture or whatever, or even uh, as it's put here, Arab, Arab colonization. Yeah. We have another question from Patience Williams. Uh, this talk was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, question, can you discuss the value giving oneself and in the world when the mind is no longer colonized, the lasting benefit? Mm. If the mind is no longer colonized, then it would be something like what uh, Rabindranath Tagore's quote said in his poem. That is what the mind would be like, you know, without any narrow domestic walls. This is what we, that this is from the, the poem is, I, I, when I read it as a child, I found it very inspiring. And somehow it has always, it's been like something like the philosophy of my life and my work also. So this is if you are free of that, you know, no longer, mind is no longer colonized. It would be so really something like the poem stated. We have another one from Ruta Tafere. What kind uh, you do as a person of color living in a white dominate society to protect yourself is it a never ending healing process i think it depends a lot whether it is a never ending healing process it depends a lot on yourself how confident you feel how you're able to deal with those wounds you see we i mean we need to keep in mind as i mentioned earlier you have some you have people supporting you supporting anti-racist movements. But you also have people who are convinced of uh, imperialist ideology. So we need to reckon with the fact that we just might, you know, be confronted with people or encounter people like that. This would be a never ending story. But the point is when you are hurt, when that wound is there, how do you deal with it? A lot of it, has got to do with yourself too. How do you heal yourself when you are hurt? That's the question. And sometimes it, you may not have, you know, you just might be on your own. You might not have somebody to just hold your hand and say, yes, I understand it is painful. And sometimes you just might be lucky enough to have someone who can hold that hand and say, yes, I understand the pain and let me apply some balm. It's a lot to do with yourself too. Mustafa Harwa ask, massive thanks for the valuable presentation. Um, 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 how can we relate colonialism to its effect on the family as an institution in India and elsewhere? So though I'm not sure if I've really understood the question correctly, but the uh, question was about how colonization, how what the effect it has on the family as an institution in India and elsewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. Um, well, the examples that I gave were based on my experiences in India, in family experiences also in India. And uh, you see, my parents, they were, they were born and brought up in colonial India, right? And yet they managed to impart on us the importance of, um, you know, being free and liberated. At the same time, you have society, you have education, which still interferes with your parental upbringing and tells you, you know, there is this imperialist ideology and you're inferior. Yeah, so you might even like, I've had, for instance, visitors for, from India who um, 
the example I gave you of, you know, with the fork and knife, who do feel embarrassed that they cannot use cutlery. Yeah, and things like these were simple examples which came from, from family life too. Yeah. Uh, Kibale Suzelon asked, what is the value of allyship in your opinion? Could you like, maybe explain that a bit, what you mean by allyship? Like, I'm sorry, but I didn't really understand the question. Yes, uh, it's a uh, Kimberly Suzelan. It's just for, you, you just you just write it and on on the QI. What is the value of allyship? I don't know allyship. Uh, allyship, in your opinion, maybe uh, uh, if uh, he can uh, uh, write uh, on the on the on the chat uh, what what he want to mean about allyship. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then as I, I know it as as a, like a practice of. Um, emphasizing social justice, but I'd, I'd rather be a bit clear on the question maybe than I'd be able to answer it properly. Yeah. Okay, uh, you can move around uh, the next one from Ria Chin. How can colonized people uh, decolonize it their mind? I think by, through awareness, through awareness. And that's the example I gave with this workshop on dignity that I do. So you know, what does dignity mean to you to, you know, to where is dignity violated? And you don't have to wait till it is violated. So you, what you need is a lot of self reflection, and awareness, and observation. Watch, watch how dignity is being violated. There are ample number of exp examples you'll find in society, in day to day life. Yeah. And through awareness, is where you can decolonize. It's basically liberating your mind from any kind of, you know, rigid ideological structures. Nirupa Shanti Prakash uh, want to know, uh, first, thank you so much for your wonderful talk, Pritima. I wonder if you can say something about the situation yeah. in India uh, regarding skin color before British colonialism and if and how is it related? So if you look at the history of India, this will be going back into quite a few thousand years ago when it was invaded by the Aryans. You also had this, um, you know, Aryans who were white skinned and things like that. So there are a lot of studies which were, you know, the Aryans who invaded India who were white skinned, um, who then became the invaders or conquered India. And then a uh, couple of thousands of years later came the British. So those who were actually natives in India, those were like the Dravidian tribes, they were kind of pushed backwards. They were, they became the ones who had to serve the invaders. So if you look at, for instance, Hindu, Hindu literature, Indian, you know, Hindu literature, you will find a lot of also, you know, where skin color, fair skin is also looked upon as a beauty ideal. But at the same time, you will also find in South Indian literature, uh, pictures of gods or goddesses, half goddesses, demi goddesses, who are also dark skinned. So you will find Hindu gods, like talking about those in, you know, before skin color, before British colonialism. I think this is what he's referring to. You also have the gods, Indian gods, who are dark skinned, who are worshipped. Yeah. So you can't, I mean, what I'm saying is we have taken over these ideals from, uh, from these imperialist, from imperialist ideology. And it is obviously a bit reinforced through ancient Indian culture too, yeah. But at the same time, I have to admit when you read ancient Indian literature and culture, books on culture, you will find um, there isn't so, there is on the one hand, um, this aspect of uh, um, white skin, which is also considered beautiful and you will also find South Indian literature where darker skin is considered beautiful and is worshipped. Yeah. 
So it is a complicated issue. Carlos uh, Antonio Gonzalez Carrasco want to know, is uh, coloniality about power relationship? Who own and control knowledge in the mind, race, gender, culture, political? Mm -hmm. I believe colonialism is about power. That's what it is about. And that's, that, that's the difference between colonialism and imperialism. Colonialism was, I mean, if you look at it, it was a political conquest, one people conquering the other. And the other is the imperialist ideology, which was imposed on the colonized people. And uh, as I mentioned it, you know, if you, if you believe that uh, the, the culture of the tribal people is uh, infantile, as I said, and freedom struggle, um, you know, is then described as infantile, and it's, uh, you know, it's like some, some, some kind of madness that the brain produces, um, they serve their purpose, they serve the purpose of the colonizers, because they wanted to retain that power. Yeah. So it is definitely a power relationship. Yeah. Tamara Laszlo want to know, at the level of the values, is it possible that imperialist cultures need healing themselves from a dominant focus on admiring independent togetherness alone in order to practice empathy for vulnerability or interconnection, you might need to have felt acceptance being vulnerably connected yourself, what healing could be done? Yeah. So one aspect, as you mentioned, is whether, is it possible that imperialist cultures need healing themselves? Uh, yes, and from a dominant focus on mm, on admiring independent toughness alone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they definitely need healing. And um, give me give me a second to think about this. Was a very interesting question. In order to practice empathy for vulnerability or interconnection, you might need to have felt acceptance, being vulnerable connected yourself. So what healing can be done? Mm. I think you need to, to look at your experiences. What exactly are you? Because we all have these structures. You may not even be aware of where you get these structures from. You may not even be aware of where you get these ideologies from. What we need to do, as I mentioned before, you need to do a lot of self-reflection. Honesty is the word. Take a look at what you are yourself. Be more aware and more alert. That is the very first step. And the healing is the next step that comes. Yeah. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Okay, we have another one from uh, Reynold uh, Titus. Uh, is it true that colonizers often prefer to believe that colonialism is in the past? If so, how do you bring up the issue and its continued impact today still, especially in conversation in the Western context? I believe, what I believe is I wouldn't, I would, I would not generalize and say all, you know, ex-colonizers uh, believe that colonialism is in the past or whatever. What I would say is you will find people even today who believe in the theory of imperialism. This is what I would say. And who still believe colonialism is their right, is the right thing that they are doing. That's one part of the question. This is what I believe. Um, and if that is the case, how do you bring up 
the issue and its continued impact today, still, especially in conversations in the Western context. Actually, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I do these workshops and I raise these issues. I use, these, I use a few post-colonial concepts and I raise these issues. That's what I do. I'm not sure whether I understood this or answered this question right. Um, but in my workshops, which I work with, with participants, I address these issues. That's what I do. But you, you see, you have to you have to lead towards these issues. You have to lead towards these concepts. You have to prepare the ground for them to also be open. You need to provide that platform where they are also willing to open up and discuss these issues if it's possible. And then there are some who are just not willing to see it. And those are the ones which are very difficult to tackle. Uh, going back to the uh, Kimberly uh, Sutherland question, uh, it was about what is the value of allyship in your opinion? And you say being an ally to the oppressive. Mm. One minute. Now, this one is. Um, can you can you repeat that question again? Okay. Please? Okay, Kimberline. Uh, uh, first, it, uh, the, the question was, uh, what is the value of allyship, in your opinion? Uh, the question was uh, to if you can determine uh, a more clear uh, what you think about uh, allyship, and then allyship. Uh, the second one is for him. Uh, being an ally to the oppressive. Oppressed. Yes. I think as an, in my opinion, as an ally, you can do healing. You are the one who are then in a position to apply that balm. Like for instance, when, I'm just giving you an example, when my kids experience racism, we're all hurt. My husband too, my husband is German, but he's also the one who applies the balm. You see, but this is obviously family. But I've also, I've also experienced. Um, I've also, I've also had allies. I've also had friends who can assist, can also accelerate that process of healing. And then you don't feel you're so alone. You don't feel that the world is so bad. You know, when you have those experiences, then you feel what a rotten world. And then you have someone to say the world is not so rotten. And that's the importance of allies. I'm glad I, I asked this question. I'm glad I um, asked to elaborate on this question. And the, the last one is from Judith uh, Major, um, uh, asking, first of all, thank you for your talk. My question is, you mentioned the upcoming anti-Semitism in Germany. Do you see a relation with colonialism? If yes, can you elaborate on this subject? Um, there's one thing I'd just like to clarify here. I'm not talking about the upcoming anti-Semitism in Germany. Anti-Semitism in Germany was and is an, I don't know how many centuries old topic. Yeah, so it's not something that is coming up now. It's been there. We just need to look at the Third Reich just to go back a few decades ago what anti-Semitism was. So it's not something that's come, coming up now. And do I see a relationship with uh, colonialism? I see more than a relationship with colonialism. You know? uh, Tam Tamara, uh, say thank you for your great talk. And Kimberly, uh, Suzanne, uh, say again, thank you for your answer. And ally is showing empathy. And the more allies there are, the better uh, the healing will be No. And right now, I just want to say uh, we yes. are landing uh, to the end of the session because you are uh, uh, more than one hour, 41 uh, minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pritima. Chanani, uh, thank you for your useful insight and your great thank presentation. You. Uh, thank you also to my colleague, uh, Sietar Europa 
board of uh, director, uh, Ivan Vanderpool, uh, trainer consultant. And thank you also for this wonderful audience. And I think uh, I can uh, say uh, you, uh, uh, you did uh, the right decisions uh, to spend your precious uh, time attending this anti-racism learning session. We will share uh, soon the recording uh, session in our YouTube uh, channel. Last but not least, it will be another pleasure to see you to the next uh, anti-racism session. Bye and best wishes having a very wonderful 2021 year. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation, for participating, and also for the very interesting questions. I wish I had had more time than we could have had more opportunity. I would have gone into more details uh, as far as your questions are concerned. But as I said before, you're most welcome to get back to me if you have any further questions or any, anything else that you'd like to clarify concerning this presentation. I was very happy to be here today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Papa, to, for moderating this discussion, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. <laughs>